All right, all right. Welcome to the Real Estate Blog Podcast, where we ask our guests the hard questions by taking a deep dive into how they've built their teams, marketing strategies, and systems and processes, and how they've built a machine that spits out consistent real estate deals. Well, the value given to the show will help you find and create consistent real estate deal flow. Today, I have a great guest, Rafael Cortez. What's up, my man? What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Rafael, tell us, how did you? why did you get into real estate? What were you doing prior? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a, you, you picked a you picked a pretty. It all, <clears throat> it all started on a on a rainy afternoon in in 1983, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, bro, I uh, I actually got into real estate by by accident. So I was I I used to be a fireman. I was a fireman when I was uh, uh, 19, and this is back in Yuma. Um, and um, I launched my first business, which was a transportation business. And uh, when, when I turned uh, 21, I started working on the business plan, launched it and did all kinds of stuff. So I had that business for, for about eight years. But in the interim, uh, I was able to put some cash together and I wanted to invest in something. Right. Like I went back to to um, <clears throat> to the grassroots. I mean, I, I I used to work construction when I was going through through high school and college. Mm. So I was like, I know how to swing a hammer. Let's try that. Uh, so I started with uh, fixing and flipping in, in 2009. Okay. Did a couple of uh, uh, rehab projects, messed them all up. I mean, the first one went, I broke even. The second one, I made a little bit of money. Then the third one was better. But I, I realized that I was buying properties off market from this one dude uh, that kept finding properties, right? Um, and, um, and I mean, that's really kind of like the uh, how the entire thing came about and, and you know, and turned me into to a wholesaler there because they saw the guy pushing paper, making more money than I was. Uh, and yep. it was totally on me. Like I messed up the rehab. So like, don't get me wrong. It, it's like <laughs> I messed up. The, I, I should have done a lot more, but I didn't know what I was doing. We just don't know what we don't know. Right. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then um, I, I got into wholesaling at that point. Uh, I started, you know, I went to YouTube university. Uh, I tried a, a thousand different ways of, of, you know, doing marketing and, and whatnot. I ended up um, uh, working for uh, Sean Terry, uh, for a while. So I became his acquisitions guy. And I mean, that really cut the learning curve for, uh, for me. I didn't realize how big of an opportunity that was when I first, uh, when I first started, cause I mean, I was still fresh in wholesaling, but, uh, but yeah, man, I mean, ever since it's just <laughs> like, you know, game over, like that's, that's, that's the vehicle of wealth. <laughs> no, for sure. And I know you've told this story probably a hundred <laughs> times on different podcasts. And I, again, I appreciate you sharing your story here, but me and you have obviously something that um, that we could relate to. You know, we were both firemen before this, but yeah. then you also went off and you started a whole ambulance company in itself, knowing the the difficultness uh, of starting that company. So you already were kind of had this like entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and then what happened to that company? And then why did you decide <clears throat> to say, you know, what, forget that I'm done being a fireman, done running this other company and then get into real estate? Um. I think it all comes down to perspective, dude. I mean, I, my world was this big, right? Uh, <laughs> and, and I, like, I, <clears throat> I knew the fire, uh, the fire world and the EMS world. And, and then, so because that was my context, that's the only opportunity that I kept seeing. Right. right. So I was like, what, you know, where can I dig into? I, I wasn't even thinking about real estate back then. Um, but, uh, I had no other, you know, sources of influence and, mm. um, and I was actually having a couple of beers with uh, with my captain. I, I uh, may or may not have been 21 at the time. Um, <laughs> and um, and the uh, the the conversation about like us having 24 hours on, 24 hours off, mm -hmm. uh, and then going on Kelly days for four days where you're not doing anything, just sitting on your butt. Like that's a yep. lot of time to do something else. Especially at that age, you're just, yeah, you're just chilling, yeah. you're drinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, there wasn't a lot of. Uh, you know, processing going through through my mind, right? But like this mm -hmm. guy's got a point. Um, and he had he had a I don't know, 10, 15 years on me. And he goes, um, I'm a, I want to start a, a business. I want to start a funeral home. Hmm. Uh, I was like, all right, you're a medic. So like <laughs> crude humor, right? Like you do the math, um, yeah. keep the business going. But um but he, he, he he's, goes, he's, in, he's in the ambulance he puts a little uh little business card in the, yeah, yeah exactly in the, in the like patient just, just yep. in case i don't do a good job you can still call me afterwards <laughs> um 
But uh, so, I mean, we laughed about that, you know, literally for a while. And then he goes, a, a really, another really good business would be, you know, ambulettes. Like there's some, mm. you know, wheelchair and stretcher patient transport. There's like the services out there suck, man. Like they're, they're, they're not, uh, you see the people, they're raggedy. The vehicles are all messy. They're dirty, nasty. And, and we, I mean, you know, we carry that, that fire discipline, right? right. <clears throat> so so it was like all right cool and, and it just kind of planted that seed man planted that seed you never know which conversation is gonna you know completely throw you uh in a whole different direction and that to me was one of them um and um and shout out to uh to good captain uh caesar uh from back in the day but uh, you guys you guys you guys share this with them no. <laughs> yeah yeah no and, and you know fast forward uh, i don't know maybe five six years um, he, I mean, now I think he's got three funeral homes in, in Yuma. I built that company. I had it for eight years and I sold it. Um, so, uh, I, I ended up uh, buying this one vehicle at the auction, you know, just hustled through the entire thing, bootstrapped it. And then, um, I, by the time I sold it, I had, uh, 40, 40, what, 30 vehicles, 40 plus employees. Really? And, yeah. Wow. So, I mean, it, it grew really into grew this, it. this thing that was, you know, this healthy thing. Yeah. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that takes a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of logistics and transportation. Oh yeah. And I mean, it's just, you know, the, I was chasing the dollar and that was the idea that came, you know, like that was really presented on me. It wasn't even a creative thinking thing. I was like, all yeah. right, shit, I'll do that. Um, and, uh, and then I, I started to understand, right. That as we go through the process of entrepreneurship, we start looking for opportunities. It has to <clears throat> align it has to be in alignment to the person that you want to become the crazy thing is that um i didn't start thinking about the person that i wanted to become until i was in like my mid-20s um mm. maybe even late 20s that's started, than a lot of people yeah yeah so so now i mean i think there's more awareness because i mean you see it all over social media and whatnot but this is you know this is years ago right yeah and um and the awareness wasn't so present so um so to me it was just kind of okay cool let's see what uh, you know what fork on the road I come across and then you'll make a choice on that. Um, mm. but yeah, so that, you know, eventually <clears throat> led me to, to real estate. And, um, and, uh, I mean, just the, the lessons and learned though, through that first business, I think carried me, um, through, through a lot of the, um, I think struggles, you know, that we get in the beginning. I mean, at that point, man, I was going through, you know, dry, uh, you know, sprouts where no deals were being done or anything like that. Um, and oh, wow. I mean, I would think back at the transportation business, like this is cake. Yeah. So we're talking, we're talking about real estate now, right? Cause, <laughs> yeah. um, gosh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So this is uh, kicking it off, right? Like when I, when I started, when I jumped into wholesaling and doing the fix and flip and all that stuff, I mean, sometimes we get a, a ton of cash and then sometimes, you know, it used to be dry, right? Dry runs. And, and, um, and I would think back at the transportation stuff. It was like, it's easy. Like there, there's no way that that you can make this amount of money in, in any of the other industries this this quick and this okay. easy. I mean, it, it really is. It's, it's an incredible opportunity. So well, to well, me, go, it's the best vehicle for wealth. <laughs> absolutely. Well, going back to that, I mean, you had this you had this many units. You had a uh, good a chunk of employees. I mean, and I get you're, you're it sounds like you're the founder. I mean, why the heck would you yeah. even leave that business? I mean, it sounds like, hey, why not just keep scaling? Why not? Why not keep being the best metro um, ambulance company in Phoenix? Because <clears throat> I already was, bro. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, yeah. so, so, you, so you hit so you hit the yeah. top of the ladder. <clears throat> yeah, I, I hit the epitome of success. What, no, what, no, that, no, what, was, was, what was the company far, called? Far so from far. it. Far from it. Uh, Netcore Transports. OK. So, uh, yeah, but no, I mean, we were doing we were doing pretty good. We had a you know, good reputation, good quality control and all that stuff. And I grew mm. up to a point where uh, we were generating good revenue. And then I realized that uh, the uh, you know, the the if I wanted to grow that revenue, the headaches and the overhead grew along with it. So it wasn't right. you know, everything correlated across the board. So it wasn't one of those things where I can keep scaling um, without putting more, more, you know, brain damage into it. So <laughs> just the model wasn't right for me. The, you know, it was, wasn't, it, it just wasn't one of those things that, um, that I wanted to be, you know, continue being a part of. Uh, and then when I did get started, I brought in a, a, um, a partner, um, a silent partner for, okay. for cash, right. And put a, you know, small amount of, of uh, money into the deal and I gave half of the company. So, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And I'm 21 years old. So it was like, all right, cool. Let's right. split it. And, um, 
the thing grows and we start, you know, I mean, generating really, really good revenue, I was able to uh, to secure government contracts and wow. and and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I was uh, the workhorse and I mean, everything was just kind of being split halfway. So I, I, I ended up making a choice. I was like, no, I'm going to put all this effort into something else. Um, sold my my portion of the company. Um, then eventually he got bought out, too. But the guy that bought it, I mean, he's uh, we're actually pretty good friends now. And and um and he doubled he doubled the size of the company so i run into the vehicles wow. all the time it's kind of you know it's one of those really cool things that you see somebody Very getting cool. off of a you know one of those vehicles and it's like man they started that thing in my living room yeah <clears> that is very cool and a cool accomplishment so okay so so you decided yeah. to sell the sell the company it sounds like it was just yeah. kind of driving you into grinding you into the ground you, yeah. you said you got your first deal was a fix and flip how did you get that i mean that, and that in our questions that we're going to talk about today that is our first question how did you get your first deal and what did that turn out to be i bought it from a wholesaler um, okay so i saw it on social media and, and uh, again like i wanted to put i wanted to put some money to work and what i knew how to do was swing a hammer i was like all right cool i can do repairs mm -hmm. i can do you know i don't know rehab a kitchen and um and i started looking at social media i joined a couple of investor you know um um groups and 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 this guy posted a property I'm like okay that looks good i didn't dude like i i feel like i got lucky because i didn't do a lot of due diligence mm. I, like you know by any means um and i mean i think my comps were even off i mean it, it's, <laughs> it's insane. i should have lost like i don't know fifty thousand dollars on it and they didn't thankfully but um uh, but uh but yeah so i bought it from this guy and, and um and then i bought the second property from this guy as well and by the third um, rehab deal, I actually took time to look at the settlement statement when, mm -hmm. I, when I was buying the property. And um, and it said assignment fee, $18,000. Um, I was like, all right, cool. And I called them up like, bro, like, what's this assignment thing that's, that's yeah. on here for 18, 18K? Oh, like, that's what you're paying me for the property. Like, wait, wait, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> like but wow. what do you mean? Um, and he goes, well, yeah, I mean, I'm doing an assignment to you. I got the property for a lower price with, and I, I just didn't understand the concept. You know what I mean? Right. Of wholesaling. And, and I don't know if the audience, uh, your audience is, is, you know, mainly wholesalers and it's something that's, you know, kind of like lingo at this point, but, yeah. but it's, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, he was negotiating the property for a lower price then marking it up 18 K and then I was buying it from him. There was still room in the deal. So on that third deal, mm -hmm. I mean, I did okay. And I should have done better on the first two. I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, so <laughs> there was, there was meat in the bones, like no, no, no hate towards a wholesaler. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but my first reaction was not to get pissed off. I was like, bro, how do I do that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, he pointed me to a, to a podcast uh, I listened to that podcast, and on that podcast, I found Sean, uh, I found Sean Terry. Uh, I started listening to his stuff, and I closed a couple of wholesale deals myself. Then in the interim, I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm done with the transportation business. I'm going to sell it. I sold it. Um, and it, it's just funny how things kind of, kind of pan out. But during that, like, that same two, three-day period, Sean sends out an email looking for an acquisitions guy, right? And I find out that he's in Maricopa County, so he's in my backyard. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, cool. This is the guy that I'm, I'm, I've been following on the podcast, so I know he's legit because I closed a couple of things with with his, with his info already, right. and um, and I apply for it. He calls me months later, and and uh, I was like, man, I'm thinking there, and the I can't I can't lie. The ego got to me a little bit because like, am I gonna go back to work after being a you know a, a, a boss? Right. Like, Shit. Yeah, I'm in a whole new industry. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like that's after I thought you know you know I thought about it for for a while and. And um, so I, I took that opportunity. I mean, I saw it as a paid internship, w went to work. My idea, honestly, and I told him this, that was to stay, you know, stick around for maybe a year. I'll mm -hmm. do the best, you know, the best I can for a year. And, and uh, you know, more than likely, I'll, I'll try to pan out. Three years later, bro, I'm, 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 you know, speaking engagements and doing keynotes on stage and and uh, and just, you know, parting ways from from him. But it was a really, really good learning experience. Oh, yeah. Um, I was going I was going on a an average of 25 appointments a week. So five appointments, face-to-face oh, wow. -face appointments a day. Um, I closed 1.2 my first year. And then every year after that is just kept getting bigger. So, so wow. uh, yeah, I mean, it was just insane that, you know, how quickly it went right after, <clears throat> after I made the choice to jump into it and, and really committed to it. So there, there are a few things I want to touch on. So one, you said you bought um, a property off a wholesaler. 
And yeah. that just kind of show, and you had no idea what assignment was. Cause it's funny nowadays, even my dispo guys is that they have this idea that everybody knows what a wholesale fee is or whatever. And yeah. that's totally untrue. We could find buyers that don't know what a wholesale fee is. Yeah. And, and we got explain- <laughs> to explain to them. Right. Yeah. Um, and also I want to touch on what was the podcast that listened that you listened to that shot you to Sean Terry. Um, top Tobek podcast oh there you go there you uh, go yeah, top back. he's still he's still going man he, i didn't know he was go- i didn't know he was wrong yeah he's still going <laughs> yeah i mean i just saw him at brent uh brent daniels's office um Very cool. so yeah he's still he's still at it um and uh so i listened to his podcast Todd Tobek's spot i think the first five episodes are really solid if you go uh, over mm. to to his podcast and um but he had sean on one of them and then sean mm. mentioned that he was in maricopa and that's how i started following him and then gotcha. it just kind of you know another fork on the road man i was like <laughs> i had it, no creativity <laughs> hasn't sean tried to uh like recruit you back yeah well i mean he's, he's, he's <laughs> put it out there like it goes bro like if you ever get uh, i actually had him on my podcast um, nice. um a while back and and I mean, it's just cool to go back down memory lane. We had a really good, solid hour and a half conversation about the old days. So, oh, very cool. Yeah, that was fun. But um, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's just it's interesting, man. How things just kind of develop. I've always been an entrepreneur. <clears throat> I'm very grateful for that experience, though, because I, I I I think it was one of the first times where I got my I I got out of my own way, mm. and and allowed the thing to 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 work. So, um, but yeah, I had a lot of autonomy. I was going to a bunch of appointments. I went back to school and, and I was, um, um, I got my bachelor's degree. I got a master's in psychology and then I got, I was getting my second master's degree in psychology at that point too. So it was a lot of things, you know, happening. Yeah. I did well on the sale of the company. So I was, you know, I was well off, but then I started killing it in, in, in wholesale and mm-hmm. I'm like, all right, cool, sweet. Like this is, this so- is it. So you were an acquisition person for one of the top wholesalers in the country. You crush it the first three years, you know, doing a bunch of cool things with him. But now you're not with him anymore and you're on your own doing some amazing yeah. things as well. Now, what was the reason why you decided to go on and make your own wholesale company? And then what, did you find any struggles on that or did you kind of hop right in, dive deep and took off? What does that no, look like? So, so I, I branched out because I got my broker's license and I, I okay. launched the brokerage. Um, and then I got my, um, so I've, at that point, I've been consulting uh, with businesses hmm. for a period of time, wow. um, which is another really cool story. I got to, you know, somewhat do a, do a, um, uh, you know, practice some of my organizational psychology skills inside Sean's uh, company at the beginning, because yeah. we were creating systems and processes and scorecards and, and fine tuning and tweaking and all that stuff. And I was running acquisitions, right? But we we always had a Monday meeting where we would come in and then break everything down, um, and then just you know improve from there. So it was a, it was a really good workshop space for me, you know, to just wow. kind of practice everything that was going on. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it was a win throughout. So so, um, um, but yeah, I mean, at that point, it's you know we have it in us, man. We have it in us, and and you know, it's I've always had my own, my own stuff going on since, you know, I was 20 and, and, um, I mean, that's 20 years ago and, and it's, it's hard to break away from that. You know what I mean? Yep, so yep. I, I stuck around for that long though, because, um, one, I respect the guy, um, everything, you know, I was learning, he was, he was pushing me in so many different ways, uh, and forcing me to kind of, you know, uh, through trial and, you know, kind of trial by fire, you know, per se. Yeah. Right. But, um, but he was presenting opportunities in front of me. Like, for example, the first time I spoke in a room was at, um, you know, big room like that mm-hmm. was at uh, Flip to Freedom. He oh, wow. uh, he tells me on Tuesday, he's like, hey, I'm going to need you on stage on Friday. Uh, <laughs> I was like, what? Like, yeah. So, I mean, next thing you know, you have this big ass conference room full of people, uh, hundreds of people in there. And then I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, um, a presentation, you know, that goes on an hour and something. So. So, you know, stuff like that. And it just, you know, every single one of those things um, has been a, uh, a like a benchmark. Right. But I mm. think more importantly, a a marker for growth like that pushed me into a whole different thing. And then uh, people started reaching out, you know, a couple of years go by after I I, um, I leave Sean's um, company and I started doing my own thing. I, I went back to wholesaling because the deals were, you know, they were still there. The relationships were there. People started asking me for, you know, acquisitions training, um, hmm. you know, how to close, 
Um, then I became known as a systems guy. Next thing you know, I'm the podio guy that codes podio and all kind. Of, you know, it's just opportunities kind of started, you know, coming coming at me from different angles. And and um, you know, it can get noisy, but I, I feel like if we have a, a a decent grip on on where we want to go, um, you know, you, you're gonna be okay. You're right. gonna be okay. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. <laughs> you know, one thing that we always see, and I guess it's a two part, right? You could. You can answer this through Sean's uh, first year with Sean, or you can answer this with uh, your own first company or a wholesale company. We go through this struggle, a lot of people, and you already know because you're a coach as well, where you do a deal here and there, then you get that kind of consistent deal between, you know, one a month and then consist consistent deal flow, right? What did what do you what advice would you give somebody or what advice do you give your coaching students from how to get a deal here and there, you know, once to every every other month to consistent deal flow. One of the one of the most uh, asked questions, um, you know, it's actually one of the biggest struggles that people have, right? Like wholesalers have in general. Like, how do we keep that consistency going? Um, it, it's lead gen, man. Like, there's hmm. no, there's no. If you're looking for a secret button, lead gen. Think about it. Even if you're a solo operation, right? If you're a, a, a solo wholesaler, you're looking at you're hustling there and, and, and you're looking for deals and all that stuff, which, by the way, hustle is a season. It's not a business strategy. You have to you know, switch that hustle mentality to entrepreneur mindset hmm. um, and start systemizing. Yep. <clears throat> um, but um, the, think about it, right? If you're a solopreneur, you're doing you know, everything by yourself. Um, you lock up a deal. Now what you got to do? You have to go up and ask, or you have to go and then find a buyer for it. You have to do, you know, all kinds of other stuff, right? What are you not doing during that time? You're not lead generating. Right. Um, and if you're not lead generating, when you get that deal sold and placed, you have to start from zero as opposed to just pick up another acquisition deal that came in or another hot lead. You have to go yep. source it from the beginning. Um, yeah. So so it, it really is. Like, I, I feel like the first hire that we need to have, and it can be a little... Um, it can be a little scary, right, to bring somebody on board, but it's it's got to be, if you're cold calling, if that's your strategy, cool. Somebody do, to keep doing that and hitting the phones on a regular basis. You can have somebody drive for dollars. You can, um, I don't know, set up somebody to run your PPC campaigns if you have the capital mm -hmm. for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but that that faucet, man, has to be flowing, not fully open all the time because you're going to get bottlenecked, but it has, right. I mean, it's got to have a, a consistent flow. Um, and I think, um, you know, the first things that, that we do whenever we get strapped for cash is uh, I'm going to stop marketing. It, it's <laughs> the worst thing that we can do because that stops yep. everything else. <clears throat> it, um, so if you're talking consistency, uh, if you have a decent process on how to source leads, how to convert leads and then negotiate. So I, I break it down into six different stages in my wholesale business. Uh, but if you have a good process on how to do each one of those, like you're always going to have the, the pump uh, something on the pipeline, right? That's working. Right. No, a hundred percent. I, I love, I love that strategy. It's not just a simple, Hey, come convert the deal. Well, it's like, how are you going to convert something if you don't have leads? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You, you have to, and, and uh, like my process, if, if you want, I mean, I can give you some of the details of that. I have no problem sharing. Um, but we have, like, uh, I have a small team of cold callers. I've had five yeah, cold callers. Yeah. Cause we were actually going to go into that, right? We're going to talk about your teams and marketing strategy and Raphael, that's, that is my, actually my next question. What does your team look like now? Oh, beautiful. Uh, well, since you asked, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, um, I have five cold callers. <clears throat> uh, I okay. have one lead manager. I have um, one acquisition rep and I do, I do the structure on, on, uh, on more advanced deals. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain okay. that in a bit. I have a dispo manager and a dispo transaction coordinator slash marketer. Right. Okay. That's, that's the entirety of my team. Um, they're all virtual except my dispo manager. Oh, wow. They're all virtual. Um, so they're all in the Philippines and, and you know, they get mm. uh, incentives with closings and, and all that stuff. Great team, dude. I mean, wow. uh, great team. Uh, they they kill it. And um, and so the way the way it works is the cold calling team is, is running. So we do cold calling. We do SMS. Those are okay. the two main main uh, sources of uh, what leads. what pla what platforms are you using? Ready mode. OK. Ready mode for cold calling, and then um, for SMS we e we do launch control. Perfect. <clears throat> um, 
and I have all the stats for ready mode. It was kind of, you know, the tricky to get it to that, uh, to, to the point where we understand it, but right, um, here's what you can expect. For example, if you're thinking about hiring a cold caller and what that looks like, um, I, this is what we found out or what I found out, right? Um, you want 10, if you're going to hire a cold caller, make sure that you have enough data. It's not just the payroll that you're hiring. You're, you're actually ha you know, bringing in the, the overhead of the data, the skip tracing and, and yeah. the seats, right? So 10,000 records per seat per month. That's what we have mm. uh, on the cold callers. 10,000 records per seat per month. You throw that into ready mode. The thing starts pumping, you know, stuff on the daily. It usually routes about 400 calls over to, to the cold callers, like per seat, right? Okay. Um, so we'll get uh, about 400 calls routed. We'll end up having around 80 conversations. And, um, and their KPI is two leads per day, per seat. Like okay. that's, that's what they got to stick to realistically. I mean, that's what you're getting, right? right? <clears throat> they will keep leads inside ready mode and then just kind of keep, you know, following up with those based on tags and stuff like that. But uh, to me, like we don't, we don't look at those until they actually, they, they get sent over to, to, to lead gen. So if they have a web form, submit through the web form, goes into my podio, my lead gen gets it. And then she will pre-qualify the leads based on condition, motivation, timeline, and price. Very cool. All right, are you um, are you just in a, are you in the Phoenix market or and what kind of yeah. list are you pulling for that? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, at this point, I have I have all the records in the county. Uh, so what we do is we refresh mm -hmm. and we just keep going, you know, through it and whatnot, right? Uh, but oh, yeah, wow. it's it's a pretty good solid backyard. Um, and and we'll do virtual deals too. So we'll like all JV with students all over the the country, and we oh, do nice. J, you know JV deals in, in other parts. So that's another source of uh, lead generation, right? For me, just because I'm in that uh, coaching space. Yeah. Um, but it's it's um it, it's important to have a sequence, right? So we have the uh, the initial sourcing, which is the cold callers. Um, they get leads, they submit via the web form, comes into my uh, to my lead manager, she'll pre-qualify the lead, actually have a, a more advanced discovery conversation with them. Um, and then she'll decide whether or not that lead is a prospect. So right. if, uh, if it, if it's a prospect, you know, that uh, two out of two out of four condition, motivation, timeline, and price, two out of four give us, or gives us enough fuel to actually have a negotiation conversation with them. If that makes sense. Yep. Right. How, how would, how would they, how would they, uh, they determine that that was a prospect, uh, you know, push over yes. your acquisition. Version. So we, we go off of the, after the four pillars and two out of the four pillars, um, two, means okay. that, okay, cool. Send it over to acquisitions. We'll, we'll take it from there. Right. Very cool. Um, and, uh, the first thing that we, that we talk about is, is uh, timeline to sell. I mean, that's an easy one. We start with condition, actually condition, timeline, then motivation, then price in that order. So what's the condition of the house? I mean, the typical script, right. That everybody goes through. Then we move into timeline because it's, it's a somewhat of a next, uh, next level question <clears throat> or conversation, but it's not so intrusive as to like, Hey, I see that you're losing the house to foreclosure or you're divorcing, uh, because I got you from the divorce list. Um, you know, you know, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So it, mm -hmm. it just kind of gradually, um, promotes that discovery conversation. Um, anyways, two out of four, and then the timeline, you know, when, when do they want to sell, uh, the motivation, you know, tells you, uh, you know, why are they moving into a new job or, you know, what, what the thing behind it is. And then the price, like if the price, you know, somewhat makes sense. Right. And we'll throw a, a range out there at the beginning. Right. We didn't used to do this. So we're getting a ton of leads that were just not pre-qualified. They wanted a million bucks for a, a of course. you know, $200,000 property. Um, and, um, uh, so now we do, we keep it within $50,000 of Zillow pricing. I mean, it's, I mean, it's still a wide range. Oh yeah. Well, ballpark. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's still a ballpark, but we'll, we'll drop a range. So we'll peg that Zillow price and then we'll shoot from, um, I think we have it between 60. No, we don't, we have it 70 to 85% of Zillow pricing. Okay. Um, so we'll kind of, you know, we'll do a soft pass on that. And then if they say they can work with it, you know, we'll push it over. Um, means that they're, I mean, they're, they're open to kind of negotiate, right? So we get mm. less leads on the acquisition side, um, but they're better qualified. Um, right. so, so the way it kind of, you know, trickles down is, is say that we reach out to a thousand people on the sourcing, right? A thousand people raise their hand. They, you know, I want an offer on the house. Um, then they go to prequal with my lead manager, uh, out of those 1000, maybe 100 were prospects, um, and uh, out of those one, I'm sorry, 100 were leads. Um, and then out of those 100, maybe turn into prospects, you know, 10. 
Right. So we end up talking to 10 people as opposed to a thousand, but they've already had two other points of, you know, conversations. There you go. So, yeah, that sort of thing. So, I mean, being methodical, right? So the, uh, and then the, uh, the other way, you know, when you reverse engineer the whole thing, right? If we're looking at acquisitions and we don't have enough leads, um, we'll go one step back to, to pre-qualification to lead mm -hmm. manager. Okay. What's going on? Is it a script? Did you have enough people to pre-qualify? If, if the, the answer is a yes, we'll go into the script. We'll turn, uh, go into the conversation. We'll go, what happened that they didn't get turned into prospects, uh, is the list wrong. So we'll troubleshoot that, right? Mm. If they didn't have enough people to convert to a prospect, we go one step behind to the cold callers, yeah. right? How's the health of the list? How are the numbers on ready mode? So you have the ability to just kind of reverse engineer and troubleshoot um, like the entire process right. to get rid of those bottlenecks. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the lead generation and how we make it over to, to the acquisitions process. Very cool. Raphael. <clears throat> Let me ask you this, um, with such a great process and, and so much experience behind you, what are, what's a number one struggle that you're dealing with in your business right now? Um, I would say <clears throat> keeping up with the market changes. Hmm. Okay. I mean, that's really one of the things that takes the most time. I mean, really right. staying on top of it at, at a at a at a national level when it comes to trends, right? The the process. I mean, listen, anything that you do in marketing, if you give it enough time, it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. uh, if you put throw money, you know, enough money into PPC, it's gonna work. If you throw enough money into, you know, heck, I, I still know some people are doing RVMs, <clears throat> and it works. <laughs> oh um, man. And and uh, you know what I mean. And so yeah. Um. I think I think the uh, at this point, I mean, the struggle for a while was systemizing the entire thing, okay. right? Um, and and understanding how to delegate, creating the rules, and and how to hire for them and everything. Um, that was just kind of you know laid out. It's never fine tuned because it's always changing. They always change algorithms. They change updates on on the software and whatnot. So, but I think at this point is keeping up with with uh, the market changes. I mean, what's um, one of the funny things is, is that, uh, we're, we're normally about a quarter, uh, ahead of what sellers, um, believe is going on. So right. meaning like, we know that today we have to offer 65% or 60% of what we were offering three months, like uh, three months ago, the sellers haven't gotten that memo yet. So a lot of times, yeah. you know, filling that gap is one of the, one of the biggest uh, struggles. You just got to understand how to structure deals in a better way. Um, what else can you do? I mean, if, if a wholesale deal doesn't work, can you turn it into an option? Can you turn it into a, a creative financing deal? Can you do innovation with it? Um, and you know, building the resources around that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that is, again, the whole purpose of this podcast and is from that market change. And then, yeah, one thing that I have seen that people made a lot of, um, downfalls when the market changes that people didn't act fast enough right you got yeah. like you said you got to really pay attention to that market and act fast get mentorship reach out to people in your community um, because that's how we were able to survive is that we acted fast and actually we we're doing way better than we uh, were prior to the market shift because we had to do we had to do a lot of changes focus on it we had to change our sales process we had we had to add different exit strategies and then also we um, are focused way more on inbound leads as well so mm -hmm. I really helped us out uh, get passes. Let me ask you this. What is your strategy have you, as you got, you and your team have talked to go through this recession or change or whatever we see? I don't know if we're in the eye of the storm or we're at the end, uh, but to get through oh, this. I, I think the party's just getting started, bro. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Or And coming out, out of this party at the end, even stronger and better. Um, control. One is going to be controlled. Controlled growth. Um, okay. it's tempting, right? To like, Hey, listen, this market is doing way better. And this market is doing way better. Uh, control growth, growth mm. is going to be a, a big one for, for, for us. I'm very, I'm super diligent about tracking KPIs and, and metrics and, and, you know, all that stuff. And, um, we do every morning, we do morning huddles and then we have a, a Tuesday meeting where we just, you know, go over KPIs and, mm -hmm. and, and really like go into, into deeper detail and the deals that are on the table. What are they listening to? Uh, in terms of the seller conversations, that sort of thing. So, so um, at, at this point, you know how I broke down, for example, the 10,000 records per seat per, uh, by the way, you want to have at least 30 numbers per line uh, or per mm. seat as well on the, on, on the dialer. Um, okay. Just keeps them healthier. Um, 
and um you know that sort of thing like doing that kind of stuff really is going to matter like the the, uh, the the people who are struggling right now are 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 the ones that are used to hustling through through the deals right hmm. um and if, if you don't have a methodical way of of getting through a bunch of leads and actually processing the stuff that doesn't fall through the cracks um and you're not you know you're, you're spending less money you're you're having better result with you know less effort yep. uh, i think it's it's really one of the things that's going to be key um we can't we got to run like a business like that wholesale right. hustle is it i mean it's it's nice and glorified right, right? but but the reality of it is like we just have to be smarter about it we have right. to be smart about how we spend the money what campaigns are actually working right hmm. tracking your kpis understanding what to track in the first place how to hire um how to actually keep your team accountable how to have uh, uh, them get buy-in into everything that you're doing right how do they right. get excited about your wholesale deals so, like that's kind of tough one if you have every, everybody on a payroll right um right. but it's doable like and i think that really like that collective vision of 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 where 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 the company is going as a whole uh, makes a big difference and and now it's more important than ever because it like we to go you know like the, the saying goes right if you want to go fast go go by yourself uh, if you want to go far uh, go you know with a team right um, something along those lines but but uh, <laughs> but it's <clears throat> i mean it's really important like it, it's that's what we're focusing on we're focusing on control growth we're tracking kpis uh we like we'll switch one thing today we switched a simple thing in our script hmm. um to i actually know we we evaluated a simple thing that we that we switched in our script and um and the tweak i mean gave us gave us a uh, a bump on leads not a spike but oh. a bump on leads so it's pretty interesting we just you, you know uh, we added um we also buy um you know uh, commercial multifamily and and different types of real estate deals th uh, throughout the country like that's the thing that we added to the cold calling script mm. um now we were saying that at the end of the script we right. pushed it all the way to the top before we even gave them the property address like that right. one thing brought us a couple of extra commercial leads because they usually hang up like before you even get to the address like no get me off your list boom right um right but we're we're dropping okay commercial and different types of real estate now people open up to hey i have a piece of land in the middle of nowhere that needs to be sold uh, i do have that duplex that i'm struggling with i you know um so now it's just planting different seeds on 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 context, right? And doing little things like that, like they go a long way when it comes to improving the the overall you know performance of the business. Yeah. So you kind of like start off exactly <laughs> like, hey, this is what we do. Would that add any value to you? Yeah. Is that how that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we just we we opened it up and it and, and surprisingly didn't give us a bump. It, we brought in um I think it was four four or five commercial leads and we're prospecting for residential. So, but we brought in four or five, I think it was, yeah, I think it was five leads, five commercial leads. Um, one's kind of iffy because I don't know if it's a, we're, we're not sure if it's a fourplex or a fiveplex. <laughs> like we just, we don't know if it's a, the other one is permitted, but, but anyways, yeah, like yeah. those leads, I mean, we hadn't seen that, that bump in, in, in the commercial leads uh, without intentionally marketing for it. Mm. So, I mean, that's one little, one little shift, but if you're not tracking, if you're not, you know, uh, aware of what's going on in terms of the conversations in the business, the KPIs in the business, uh, the buy-in from everybody else and asking the team, okay, what are you guys seeing that I'm not seeing? Right. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Like you, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity. Rafael, let me ask you this. What have you listened to or read that really just inspired you and that you would love to tell people to also take a hold of that? Uh, I'm a huge Wayne Dyer fan. Uh, Wayne Dyer's Wayne Dyer. Wayne yeah. Dyer. Yeah. I've never heard of him. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, 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 um, he's, he's very much in, on the, on the spiritual side of things. Okay. He just has a very calming voice, man. It's like, I don't know. I like listening to the guy when, when I'm, it, it's funny, but, um, I'll go to the gym. I'll be working out, listening to Wayne Dyer, uh, on the phone as, as opposed to, is he, is it like a podcast or audio book? No, no, no. He's, uh, he passed already, but he's, mm, um, okay. he's, uh, uh, I mean, he's a thinker really. He's, wow. yeah, he did a lot of personal growth, uh content materials and stuff like that but his um his his approach or perspective on life is, is very much on the energy side of things on the uh you know the connection with the higher self like the bigger uh, okay. biggest the better version of you right and how to tap into or how how you tap into um your universal power and that sort of thing so 
Um, it, it's one of the uh, Wayne Dyer. I mean, it's 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 out there. It's I'll, not I'll have to check them out. Yeah, it's not one of those. Um, uh, you know, like the 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 stuff that we listen to on the pragmatic side all the time, right? Right. Um, so it's very much on, on the uh, on the um, on the mindset side of things and uh, and the spiritual side of things. So it kind of connects bo- both. Both. Gotcha. Um, big of meditation as well. So I mean, yeah, I listen I listen a lot to Wind Iron. And then I mean, I read I mean I read a, a ton. It, I'm always reading. Uh, one of my favorite books is Psycho Cybernetics. I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you've mentioned that one. That's definitely. Yeah, I think uh, I, I mentioned it at the uh, the mastermind we were in. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's I mean it's just a really solid book. Like it, when it uh, when it comes to self image and and personal growth and, and and that sort of thing. So. So I know I know you use that uh, book. Uh, you know, correlating with sales. I mean, did, does he have also like a course videos like to really understand? Because I know when you explained it, it seemed pretty complicated. I mean, am I wrong? <clears throat> no, it's actually very, I mean, I think it's the simplest way to understand the uh, mm. self-perception without okay. being a psychologist. Gotcha. Uh, it, it's without having to go through through all kinds of, you know, hoops and loops. I mean, the, the book really breaks it down. That The funny thing is that the guy who wrote it, uh, Maxwell Maltz, he, um, he used to be a surgeon. He used to be mm. a plastic surgeon. He wasn't a psychologist. He was a plastic surgeon, but he started noticing that people would come to him uh, because they, they had this, this low sense of um, uh, self-esteem. Right. Mm. It's like, all right, if I fix my nose, I'm not going to be, you know, sad. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to be better. I'm going to feel you know, better about right. myself. And then he would fix the nose and then they would come back, you know, six feel months sad. later to fix the chin or something. And like, OK, cool. It's this thing. And, and it just kept going on and on and on. And and um, and um, uh, like he started questioning, like, why, why does right. it happen? You know, and dove deeper into it and, and made a, a big thing. I mean, it, it comes back from the. I mean, the guy was around doing stuff in the seventies. So, okay. So yeah, it's, 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 um, it's an older, it's an older book that's been kind of revitalized. Um, mm. but really solid uh, principles, man. Really solid. That, that's, that is very interesting, you know, right. Where he, he actually took the t- step back and he said, Hey, yeah. you know, you're not, you thought that this would make you better and that didn't make you more happier. A lot of people think that, so there must be deeper, deeper issues. Does the book go into like them, him actually getting personal with his patients? Um, yeah. On some, on some instances, yeah, he, I mean, he won't do names or anything, but he'll just close like case studies. Right. And this is what happened this is the, the example of this, this and that. Um, and I think, I mean, it really resonates, bro, because like, especially for us, right. Entrepreneurs, we go into it. And a lot of times we we're just trying to get out of that survival mode. Hmm. Uh, we're trying to like, okay, cool. I'm, and I know I got to work and perform to bring money in, uh, right. you know, to eat, um, and then, um, what happened to me and I know this happened, I mean, I, I didn't realize it until like, like years after, but I was already out of survival mode and I was still acting like if I was in survival mode, I was, mm-hmm. you know, killing myself when it came to the hours I was working. Um, I was doing stuff that I wasn't enjoying. Um, you know, this is back when, you know, the reason I sold the transportation business and, 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 and. I mean, it just landed, right? It, sometimes we forget to look intrinsically uh, to create that world that we want uh, that we want outside of us, um, and it, like it, it's really where where else where it all starts. I mean, if anything has to line up, it's just got to line up with you, right? Because you're the one doing the work, right? Right. So, Raphael, yeah. Raphael, tell us before we let you go. Tell us uh, everything that you got going on, your podcast, coaching programs. Where can we find you? Where can we get help? Where can we pick your brain a little bit more? Um, uh, well, you can find me on social media, at Rafael Cortez, CEO. Uh, I'm pretty active on Instagram, um, YouTube, my YouTube channel. I drop a lot of videos. I do a lot of videos on real estate, wholesaling, um, entrepreneur mindset. I have the CEO Pulse podcast. I bring a lot of people in, which I should have you on there, by the way. If you're game, let's do it. Appreciate it. And um, Let's do it. And, uh, yeah, I do have, um, um, I mean, I, I have some resources that I can, that I can put out for you guys and for your audience, if you wanted to. Yeah, please. Uh, um, if you go to REI wholesaling.com, um, I have a, a full breakdown of, um, I mentioned that I, I broke, I break down my, my process into six stages, uh, mm. sourcing, converting acquisitions, dispo measuring and improving. Um, I have a, a full course on, on the breakdown on how I do that. That's, wow. that's there. And it's free. It's it's uh, f- uh, free uh, to access. So it's reiwholesaling.com. Um, and yeah, right now, man, I'm excited because I I am growing the um, the um, 
Well, the wholesaling business is it's steadily growing. It's one of those things that I don't want to blow it up. You know, people keep asking me, "Why are you tapping to this market and that market and all that stuff?" It's like, right, right. It's it's, it's brain damage control. It's really what it is. Um, there's opportunities out there. If yeah. if you're thinking about getting into real estate and, and you feel like the market is weird, the you know that maybe it's not the right time. Can, you know, it's it's wrong. Like you're wrong. It's the right time. Like right now is as, as good a time as as like any right to get into real estate yep. the opportunities are out there if you do enough oh yeah um if you, if you put in the work like that's that's the thing um so growing that and then uh pulse capital i mean it's, it's again it's doing well the brokerage is doing well ceo polls which is my consulting and, and coaching business i mean that one's growing as well so yeah i'm just all over the place i'm doing a lot more of the same i'm just doing it better i feel like <laughs> there you go <laughs> then, then uh then uh you know uh, previous years. So that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That. That's awesome, brother. Thank you for dropping that for us. Hey, Raphael, we'll see you next time here at the real estate block podcast. Pleasure. Pleasure, man. Thank you for having me.